welcome to the 47th Common Ground Country Fair and our 27th Public Policy Teach-In. Thank you to all the volunteers who make this fair possible. Um, let us first acknowledge that the land we farm and live on in so-called Maine is unceded territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy whose tribal nations have stewarded this land for time immemorial. And since this is a public policy teaching, I'll mention a couple of ways you can take policy action in support of the tribes. One, work with your local school board to put Wabanaki studies in the curriculum as required by Maine law for 20 years. Two, contact your local legislator in support of tribal sovereignty so that the bill can finally pass in the next legislative service session. For more info, get on the MAFCA policy list or, um, or look at the public policy section of the MAFCA website. The purpose of the teaching is to inform you about an important public policy issue and give you practical and policy actions you can take. Let me welcome our panelists, and I'm going to introduce them all at once. <laughs> um, but you can applaud after each introduction. <laughs> yeah. Chip Osborne is president of Osborne Organics LLC and founder of the Organic Landscape Association. He has more than 10 years experience in creating safe, sustainable, and healthy athletic fields and landscapes and 35 years experience as a professional horticulturalist. As a wholesale and retail nursery man, he has had first-hand experience with the pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides routinely used in landscape and horticultural industry. Personal experience led him to believe there is a safer way to grow plants. His personal investigation, study of conventional and organic soil science practices, and hands-on experimentation led him to become one of the country's leading experts on growing sustainable natural turf. Um, he's a regular le lecturer for the Northeast Organic Farming Association, board member of Beyond Pesticides, chairman of the Marblehead Mass Recreation and Parks D Department, and a speaker nationwide on the topic of turf management for athletic fields and landscapes. Um, in 1998, he co-founded the Living Lawn Project in Marblehead, Mass., one of the country's first natural lawn demo sites. It's naturally recognized, living example that beautiful, healthy grass can be grown without pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. He remains a dedicated environmental activist speaker for communities wanting to learn why and how to change their town policies. And Chip has been helping us as we work to add the town of Cape Elizabeth to the list of more than 30 towns in Maine with pesticide ordinances. By the way, if there's anyone here from Cape please come see me after to learn how you can help. Uh, Sharon Turner, to my left, owns and operates 80-acre Crystal Lake Farm and Nursery with her son, Eli Berry, in the town of Washington. Eli is here in the audience today. <laughs> uh, their farm has been in the family for almost 70 years. When Sharon was 10 in 1955, her father purchased the former boys camp and the family moved from Connecticut to the old farmhouse. For the next six years, Sharon and her family lived a country life, learning about nature, raising livestock, and growing gardens. In 61, they moved to Brunswick. Although the farm stayed in the family, the house and land remained largely unoccupied until 95, when Eli built a cabin and moved to the farm. He spent the next five years and more restoring the land, using low-impact methods to manage the woodlands and reclaim open spaces for buildings, fields, and gardens. In 2004, he built a cabin for Sharon and 
the seed for Crystal Lake Farm and Nursery was planted. For the past 17 years, mother and son have worked together to build their business and act as stewards of this small piece of Maine. They grow mostly native trees and shrubs with emphasis on plants that are beneficial for pollinators and birds. Sharon also teaches organic gardening and landscaping classes for students of all levels with all kinds of properties. Gardening is a constant for Sharon and she's going to talk about how gardening provides balance for her day-to-day -day life. She'll share her experiences and observations about the positive impact that we can have by encouraging habitat for native plants and animals, as well as the emerging challenges we're facing as our climate changes and industrial contaminants threaten the very existence of species. Heather Spaulding is Mavka's Deputy Director and Senior Policy Director. She started working as uh, the fair director in 97 and um, worked for several years doing that before broadening her focus to market operations. Public policy has always been part of her professional work and she has been spending a lot of time, I mean, don't ask me about the midnight meetings <laughs> she leaves them, drives up here and anyhow and goes to work the next day um, advocating for federal, state, and municipal legislation that is critical to organic farmers and gardeners, addresses climate change, and supports a healthy environment, a strong rural economy, and a socially just, healthy society. A primary focus of Heather's work has been promoting safer alternatives to toxics in our everyday lives and agriculture systems. She'll speak about current pesticide policy initiatives under development in Washington and Augusta, as well as some local efforts to pass organic land care ordinances. <laughs> Good afternoon. So, what I'm going to do is to sort of set the table for why this policy discussion is critically important. Here, you, I, I know I'm speaking to the choir, but out there in the world, not so much, especially at the public sector, the municipal level, places where our children play. That's really where the focus is from my perspective and unfortunately when you look all the way up to Washington to the regulatory and I'll go through just a little bit of that there's little or no protection because regulatory is basically under the thumb of industry so we don't have protections out there so creating policy it's, it's not really good enough to go to a park department or school department and try to get them to go organic without institutionalizing it, because then staff changes. And the next person comes in and says, I don't like that, I grew up on a golf course, so I want to do it my way. So we have to work towards institutionalization of it. Uh, just briefly, my bio is probably needs to be updated. I've been 50 years as a horticulturist, 25 years managing turf and landscapes organically. 25 years of my business, I was up to my elbows in pesticides, and I was using it in the early 1970s when they were only 25 years old. And we were told that it's no big deal, don't worry about it, we buttoned up our collar, put on some glasses, a little respirator, and then went in a greenhouse. I was in greenhouse and nursery production. I realized something was wrong, and then I began to teach myself, taking my knowledge of horticulture and then overlaying organic principles as it pertained to managing in my greenhouse and then as it pertains to managing out in the public sector. My work now revolves around two distinct areas. One, educating. Educating landscape contractors, educating municipal people that work with turf and landscapes on how to do it, to take away that fear of failure that if you get rid of the chemicals and go organic, you're not going to fail. 
The other part is hands-on working with school districts and municipalities, colleges, universities around the country whenever there's a desire to move from a chemical intensive approach to a more natural approach and then we go in and do the soil testing and do that and then develop plans on how they can transition. Uh, as was mentioned, I have 20 years in the public sector as a chair of a municipal commission elected, uh, so I, I, I know full well how that segment works. And you know, all of us here at the table are trying to crack through that for policy change. So we're looking to move away from synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Synthetic fertilizers just as bad as pesticides. So we're looking to reduce and eliminate toxic pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, and frankly, even on the organic side, reduce inputs over time. The more I can get the biological life in the soil working for me, the less I have to apply to grow the crop that I'm trying to grow. We're looking to protect children's health, human health, the environment, pollinators, water. And, and honestly, when synthetics are removed, from managing plant material, the plant material gets healthier and crops get better. Just a few pictures to show you that it can be done on any scale. Uh, we have large residential, people say it can't be done, it can be done. On the right is a public playing field. That field has been synthetic fertilizer and pesticide free since 2002. And it's one of the showpieces of that particular town. Much smaller scale. In conventional land management, synthetic fertilizers, chemical pesticides, it's a quick fix approach, a product approach, there's a product for everything. So all you need is a calendar and somebody can tell you what the product is. Very often there's a prophylactic use, just mean just in case, I don't want to get a grub this year in my lawn, so just in case, I'm going to put something down there to make sure there may be none there treats symptoms. Pesticides do not solve problems. They treat the symptom. So an insect, a weed, or a fungal disease is, is simply a symptom that something is wrong in the, in the system. But we have been sold this bill of goods since the 1950s that if you subscribe to the synthetic approach, you're going to be able to manage your landscape. But at the end of the day, you're on a treadmill and you just run around chasing symptoms and never solving problems. Natural land management is natural organic product. Soil testing is absolutely the basis. I don't get involved in any project unless I'm allowed to do a full battery of soil tests, not just the simple soil chemistry, but putting it under a microscope, finding what bacteria, fungi, protozoa is there. How is that natural cycle working? And then how can I, as the consultant or practitioner, improve that natural cycling so I'm not dependent upon a bag, box, or bottle? We don't treat any symptoms, we solve problems. So if somebody has crabgrass in their lawn, they reach for a chemical control, and that treats the symptom. But if I want to solve the problem, I know that the soil might be compacted, there may be bare spots, they might be cutting the grass too short, there may not be enough grass growing there. All of those are problems. One by one by one, solve the problem, and a year and a half later, crab grass goes away. It's a different approach, a different educational approach to it, and what I try to do when I'm working with conventional practitioners is to teach them that, yes, you were trained in your synthetic approach, you also need to get education in the organic approach. So you've heard the different words, natural, organic, sustainable, regenerative. If we are truly managing organically, we are regenerative because we're trying to build soils and trying to leave soils better than we found them, whether it's in our children's soccer fields or whether it's in our backyard or our vegetable gardens. We are not embarking on a product swap. We don't simply say that's a bad product what is the good one as an alternative? We're really managing it as a healthy, biologically active soil environment and a marriage of these three concepts. A basic understanding of soil biology. We don't have to be soil scientists, we just have to know that there's organisms down there that are breaking down organic matter, and then there's higher level organisms that are consuming that. So it's a protozoa that consumes a bacteria. All we need to know is at the end of the day, that's where the nitrogen comes from. 
not from the bag, it comes from that. And we bring in photosynthesis and all those concepts because so much of the byproduct of photosynthesis goes into the soil to feed those organisms. Cultural practices, things like the right way to, to grow a plant, the right plant in the right place, how to take care of your lawn the right way, to relieve compaction, to cut it the right way. Don't put a lot of water on there. Trying to bring the cultural things to the forefront. And then it's the exclusive use of natural organic products. No synthetics allowed. So when we talk about pesticides, and I'm not going to delve into it too much, but these are questions that come up. What do you know? How do you perceive it? Are they safe when used as directed? People have heard that all the time. Have you been told they're no big deal? Have you been told they're dry to the touch? Well, there's something called a half-life that says this is the amount of time it takes for half of that active ingredient to be broken down. So if the half-life is 45 days, does whether it's wet or dry make any difference? Absolutely not. But that is the industry information that is presented to most people. We have the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, an act of Congress written in 1947. It was revised in 1972 when they put risk assessment in there, risk versus benefit. It was revised a little bit in 1988. So think of it, we are operating in 2023 with legislation that has been in place since 1972 with little or no change. So the EPA was created, they weigh the risk versus benefit. If, if, the, if the risk is too great, it doesn't come to market. If the benefit outweighs the risk, it comes to market. I've been fortunate enough to go to the EPA in Washington as a board member of Beyond Pesticides several times over the last 10 years. And they actually told us that they believe they have an obligation to provide economic benefit to the registrant. That's the chemical company. That is one of the benefits, that they make money. So we have US EPA registered pesticides, active ingredient, little bit of the product. That's what kills the pest. The biggest portion is an inert ingredient. And this is what I try to stress on the average homeowner or the municipal official, that 90, 95, 98% of what is in that bag, box, or bottle, we don't know what it is. Is protected by trade secret laws. It's not disclosed on the label. It's about 400 chemicals and they're largely not tested for human health effects. So that means 98% of what you could buy at Home Depot never was tested. So inert ingredients, a big problem. We've been trying to get full disclosure on inert ingredients and we can't get it. The EPA will not budge on that. The other thing is that when you buy that product in a store, that final container has never been tested. With all that's been tested is that 2%. All the other stuff that's in there in combination. And then when you get these three-way chemical combinations that most landscape contractors use, chemical A, chemical B, chemical C, all that's been tested is 2%, 2%, 2%. Now you've lumped it together because it's stronger and works better, never tested. So the testing is on laboratory animals and the testing is done by the manufacturer. The problem now with the testing is it's based on acute exposure to laboratory animals and what happens to that animal or successive generations. It's based on acute. What's happening now is, is new science, medical science, and the scientific community are determining that products that the EPA says are low risk at high doses are actually found to be high risk at low dose. So that's what's on our children's soccer field. That's what's on the weed and feed in somebody's back, backyard. So there's no assumption of safety. Synthetic and organic pesticides are both designed to kill pests. Synthetic pesticides are associated with long-term human health. Organic pesticides generally not. But that because a pesticide is organic does not mean we throw caution to the wind. So under these ordinances that we're talking about, we have two different groups of chemicals that can be used. Those that fall into the minimum risk category by the EPA, exempt active ingredients, uh, 25B they're called, or OMRI certified, the Organic Materials Review Institute certified. So when we're looking at policy and regulation, that is all we want allowed to be used. You probably heard it's too expensive. Uh, 
it really, if it's a product swap, it will be. But if you do it correctly, it's not. It's the building of the microbial community. And if it's done correctly over time, we save significant money. This is just a quick picture of a synthetic free renovation. All crabgrass on the left, uh, dethatch, top compost, top dressed. And that's what we had at there only about 45 days after. No chemicals involved. Expectations. We all have expectations for landscape. Because we are choosing to eliminate pesticides does not mean that we have to change our expectations. Native plantings should be the focus of the future. There's absolutely too much grass in the world. A whole lot of grass needs to be reduced and eliminated and planted with more friendly habitat. It can be done at any scale by anybody in the industry. We soil test, we determine expectations, we understand the landscape, organic input only, good horticultural practices. And the last couple of pictures here I'll show you that up on the top uh, we have you know turf grass, and then in the middle we have it's in a garden and it's a weed. But you know what that is? That's actually turf grass. It escaped from the lawn and went in the garden. But now that has to be treated, you know, as a weed. But it, right next to it, that's your lawn. The bottom pictures are part of my Johnny Jump Up, my wild Johnny Jump Up. And you can see on the bottom right, a little bit of it escaped into the lawn. It's a wildflower, now it's a weed. So somebody would want to come along and get a pesticide and, and spray that out of there so that they could have that, have that, have that perfect lawn. And then just random pictures here, all organic grass, most of it multiple years, uh, we need to change our expectation. Do we have to have a monoculture of a non-native crop? Absolutely not. Is it okay to have other plant species in there? Yes. We have to remember that the expectations that most people have for grass was created by an industry in the 1950s to sell product. We have to move away from that and we have to embrace the fact that it doesn't need to be a monoculture and we can live perfectly well and be happy, meet expectations, and be more responsible in our choices. Thank you. I'm not gonna be as organized as Chip. <laughs> um, but I did come up with uh, three key words thinking about this and, um, and how we will do what we're talking about doing, nurturing uh, native wildlife in a landscape that's pesticide free. And the words were political, diversity, and compost. So I think you kind of said some of the same thing. Um, because definitely it, it has to be political. Um, you can go to your, you know, your local store, you can go to the school, you can go wherever, you know, you need to go, wherever you see it being um, done the wrong way, and, and make something happen about that. I was at Miles Memorial Hospital in Dan Scotty recently, and, um, the buildings, there was somebody out there spraying something up against a building. There was a, um, a couple of ewes up against the building, and, and then a wide swath of that wretched black dye um, constructor, construction debris mulch. And there was a sign right, in the, right going in. It was about six feet wide, this area of nothing, except that mulch. And there was a sign saying, that, you know, the skull and crossbones. Pesticide application. I know what. No idea what they were uh, applying. You know anything to. Um, and I. I need to say something to them. I need to say something to the hospital about what. You know what are you doing to the hospital? Um, and then so public policy and you know political action and then diversity because I think in terms of planting the more variety we plant the better and yes ideally the more native plants we plant. The better, because we are we are nurturing everything, and this is the, by doing that and create recreating the balance, because it's out of balance at this point. Um, and then the other word was compost, and basically we need to be mulching it and and feeding the soil and feeding the environment with our compost. What goes to the you know the landfills is absolutely awful because that it's such a it's such a valuable organic fertilizer. Um, ideally. I think for, for people to become um, active in, in doing this, I think people, I teach a lot of classes and I think I have about 65 
people now. I do them privately, and I also do them through adult education in Camden and Rockport. Um, and um, I think the, the best thing to do is to get yourself educated. And, and not just through classes or reading, but there's a lot of good material. But to pay attention and um, to observe your landscape and um, recognizing aphids and knowing to leave them there because the ladybugs will come and will devour the aphids, and that's a really good thing. Um, snapping turtles, people freak out if there's a snapping turtle in their yard. If you just let it go by, find out where it wants to nest, mark it off, which Eli did um, a couple of years ago, uh, and it was right in the path down to the lake, right in the middle of the gravel path and, and the side of the road. So Eli marked it with, um, with wire, and um, in August sometime, some friends were there, the kids were going to go down and go swimming, and the snapping turtles hatched. And it was, it was like 25 of these little, you know, silver dollar sized snapping turtles that these kids got to watch going one right after another down to the lake. Um, and for most people, they want to take an animal and relocate it, which is absolutely the worst thing you can do. Snapping turtles live for years. I mean, they're older than I am. And um, probably that one was. But they, if it's a little they, they know their territory totally. And people think, oh, I can, I can move this to somewhere else. Or a groundhog. They're, they're not, that's not, it's just going to die the worst death than if somebody shot it. Um, I think that's really a critical thing to do is to know the animals that we want to be, you know, if we want to be nurturing them. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the, other, the other big thing that I've noticed recently is towns spraying knotweed. There's one place in Liberty where they're spraying the knotweed right along the sides of the road. And in one particular place, they're in a bridge, and the bridge goes under the Davis Stream, which goes into Crystal Lake on and on. And whatever they're spraying, you know, uh, the knotweed with, instead of having somebody cut it down, that's the other thing. We need to manage this. We're not going to eradicate it. And I think there's a mentality that people think we're going to eradicate it. We're going to get rid of it. Well, no, that's not going to happen. Um, and I think to, to it, I mean, it would employ people, for God's sake, to have them go and cut the knotweed. It's going to be there forever. And knotweed is one thing that's all over the world. Um, yeah, it's all over the world. And it was brought there by beekeepers. I mean, it's not the animal. I mean, I'm dealing with jumping worms right now. How many people in here have had experience with any jumping worms? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, so I'm harvesting these jumping worms, and I'm feeling sorry for the jumping worms <laughs> that I'm drowning, basically. Um, they didn't come here of their own accord. I mean, we did all of this, and we need to sort of be aware of that and to think that we're going to be able to eradicate it or change it dramatically. It ain't going to happen. Um, uh, the other thing that we, and I would like to talk to you more about this, but the neonicotinoids in the, uh, the stuff that's in the big box stores and the, um, and the big nurseries, they're so much, treated so much with neonicotinoids, which is a systemic poison as I understand it, and it stays in the soil and in the plant. And we're trying to buy these things, even with native plants that are for sale in big box stores, um, that stays in the plant, and that is, it's death for bees. So we're trying to buy something native that's doing something good, but killing things and damaging things at the same time. And it's all in the interest of the chemical companies, um, definitely. Um, so one of, one of the other things that we can do is definitely choose, choose native plants um, as opposed to cultivars. I'm working on a garden that's supposed to be for the boys club in Augusta with a friend who's doing it. And um, he, he asked another nursery, a, a big, big nursery, uh, to donate some plants. And, and he said it was a native plant nursery. So what, and I'm, done, I'm doing this wonderful little design that I'm trying to make happen that sort of looks very formal to try to do the crazy, the crazy asters and goldenrod in the middle. And um, so I, I got the list from what this other nursery was going to be donating. And they were all cultivars, and three of them were non-natives. And one was daily. So I said, I can't do this. You know, I can't, I'm not going to use these when I'm doing this design uh, to have it be all natives. And, and um, anyway, I called them and 
we had managed to swap out for some natives from, from them. So it, it worked out. I think I can do it. Um, but you have to be careful of them. I mean, I have people in my classes all the time, and the, the industry will say, Native R? <laughs> Is that a word? Um, native R on the, on the tag. And people think, oh, well, that's a native plant then. Well, no, it's not. It's probably a cultivar of one. Um, one of the most awful things I heard, um, I, and I actually, I actually did talk to Gary Fish about this, wondering as we see the winterberry, which is all coming into its berry form right now, growing along sides of the road. Um, red berries, people know what it is. You know, it's used for, for uh, decorations for holidays. And um, it's so cross-pollinated now and so mixed up with the original natives that you're not going to be able to tell. The worst thing I heard recently was that industry has bred, has bred um, winterberry with berries that will hang on so the birds won't eat them. So we can enjoy it, right? Um, what else do I want to say here? Uh, so the cultivar is the winterberry. Um, I think I did a workshop with Dave Callaby, and if you haven't read his uh, his books, Bringing Nature Home, and so on. Um, I would love to have him here at some point as a speaker. Um, but uh, his books are wonderful in terms of that. And what he recommends is a 70-30 balance um, so that you could have native plants. I mean, I, I don't go with the whole native thing. I mean, there are enough asters and goldenrod in the world. But, and that's so you know, prominent right now. It's just it, it's a lot. But uh, to, to make it 70-30 and try to have as many natives as possible. Um, and uh, in your in your landscape, and then you can go ahead and play with some other things. And there are wonderful things, you know, magnolias and lots of lilacs, for that matter. Um, okay, and um, the, to, to, to help educate yourself, I mean, I think Cooperative Extension is a wonderful underutilized uh, organization. But going to them when you have problems, when you have jumping worms, and you want to identify them or whatever. Uh, Cooperative Extension, the Native Plant Trust, which is in Massachusetts. I mean, they have wonderful publications and wonderful programs. Um, and then um, going to oh oh, and three there were three programs recently on main calling. I don't know if people heard them, but you can go back and get them. And um, the first one was I think um, one was turtles, and one was uh, ocean life, and the first one was plants. And Irene Barber, who's at the Coastal Maine Botanic Garden, and Gary Fish were the two um, speakers, and they were great. I mean, they really did a very good job. I would recommend any of those. And then if there are questions, I'm happy to take it, but I don't think I need to say too much more right now. Okay. We're short on time. <laughs> as fast as I could. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much to all of the panelists for being here today. Um, I just really feel honored to work with these three individuals. They've done so much to help us promote organic land care uh, concepts and practices, and we're really so fortunate to have them here. So um, I did just, I'm going to talk a little bit about some policy actions that have happened and that are about to happen, that are happening while we speak. Um, but before that, I just wanted to let you all know I have a couple of handouts that really relate to what um, both Chip and Sharon were talking about. Um, MOFCA is a sister organization to NOFA, which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association. So all of the other New England and Northeast um, states have an organization like MOFCA, but they just have NOFA, NOFA Massachusetts, NOFA New Hampshire, etc. Connecticut, um, and they have put together a tremendous program on, for organic land care for, for homeowners. And basically, what they're trying to do is help um, help people who just want to, you know, nurture their own their own habitat around their homes to embrace organic land care um, practices the way that we've established that for um, farming. And so there's this, I have a wonderful brochure from them. They've got an incredible website that you can go to to find out more information. So um, I'm going to hand around these brochures. Please feel free to take one, share one with your friend, share one with your neighbor, who you've been really hoping will like, do a little bit more in the organic vein. 
Um, and then also, um, I have a, a, a handout that um, uh, has some resources of MAFCA certified um, organic uh, uh, nurseries and places where you can get um, organic, certified organic um, plants for your landscape, um, as well as um, NOFA, Northeast Organic Farming Association, NOFA accredited um, land care professionals. Um, and so those are on this directory as well. And then there's also um, a, a website that um, is hosted by the Wild Seed Project that lists, um, yet again, another really long list of um, native plant nurseries, like Sharon's. Um, and they're, you know, across the country, actually, they have a big directory, but they, they've got a really nice list of, um, of native plant uh, nurseries in Maine. And so I will hand around um, these two handouts. You can take them, please feel free. And, um, and then I'm, now I'm going to get into a little bit more um, of the policy stuff that I want you all to know about. So um, could I just hand that up? Thanks, Holly. Perfect, thank you. So um, as Nancy said, I, I work at MAFTA and I've been here for quite a long time. Um, more in recent years, my work has really shifted primarily to working on policy. And I've been doing that in the in lots of different levels. So I work, I do some work in DC. I work in Augusta, and then I also work with um, communities um, at the municipal level. Um, and it's been great, and it's a, a lot of work that has been focused on pesticides and toxics, um, trying to promote safer alternatives to synthetic chemicals in our everyday lives, including pesticides, of course. And as Chip was talking about, we really need a, a paradigm shift on how pesticides and chemicals are created, how they're uh, tested, how they're regulated, how they're released on the market. And we really feel that you know the, the bar that needs to be set is to question whether there really is a problem there that needs to be addressed or not. First, like really make sure there is a problem that needs to be addressed. And then, can that problem be addressed with organic land care standards? Because that should be the starting point. If you can rule out, if you can prove that there really is a problem and that none of the organic land care management practices can address it, maybe you could go on, but it should be absolutely a last resort. Um, it's, it's like reaching for the, for the chemicals. And what we have found is that we have, you know, we have health reasons, we have, we have, um, have um, education that is starting to make a difference in, in, in shifting people's default practice. Um, we have um, markets, so we know that the market can really change um, the way that, that the amount, you know, the way that, that chemicals are being released into the, the environment. But you have to have policy action. It is an absolute necessity. And so we in Maine have actually made some really good progress. Um, in recent years, we've passed some pretty strong uh, pesticide policies. We um, we banned um, a chemical called chlorpyrifos, which is a very very toxic um, chemical that is used as an insecticide. Um, we banned that for all uses in this in Maine. It's a it's a stronger ban than even what EPA has finally established. We have um, restricted the use of another insecticide, a class of insecticides, which are neonicotinoids. That um, Chip, both Chip and Sharon mentioned those. But in Maine, we have made made four of the most commonly used neonicotinoids restricted, so that they can only be used by licensed applicators, and they can't be used for general landscaping. Just to make your yard look pretty, forget it. You can't use you can't use uh, neonics, as they're called. Um, we also have banned the use of glyphosate and dicamba on school grounds. 
that was an important step forward. And unfortunately, it is still, um, there still is an exemption for farms to use glyphosate and dicamba, dicamba on their property. So if they're close to schools, unfortunately, those farms still can use that, those chemicals even if they're um, in the close proximity to schools. But it was still an important um, step forward that we, we got that ban um, on, of using those chemicals on the school grounds themselves. We also passed a really important piece of legislation that requires that members of Maine's Board of Pesticides Control, at least two of the members who have public seats, cannot have a conflict of interest in their service. Um, and then we had a really good victory um, where we banned the um, spraying, the aerial spraying of um, pesticides for forestry purposes. So we got it through the House and the Senate, but unfortunately, Gover Governor Mills vetoed that um, success. So that was really, really disappointing, and we're going to keep working on it. I think that we will get there. Um, and then we also are, we recognize that data collection is incredibly important for us to understand. You know, one of our um, board members at MOFTA is always saying, you can't manage what you don't measure. Well, the state really doesn't have a way of assessing how many pesticides are being sold and used in the state on an annual or seasonal basis. And so we did pass um, you know, a, 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 a law last year that is going to at least help with gathering that data, and the, and the Board of Pesticide Control is going to require sales data to be collected um, online and so that they can start at least getting that data out to the public. Um, one of the things that we are constantly challenged by at the state and at the federal level is attempts to preempt local control. And so Nancy was talking about the different ordinances in Maine that um, ban or that promote organic land care in their communities. Well, we have many times over had to push back against legislation that seeks to, to overturn that local control. Basically, um, the corporations want to say, well, there's nothing that a town can do to make us um, use organic land care practices. But so far, we've been able to fend that off, and right now, we're trying to fend that off at the federal level with two bills that are being um, that are tr that the industry is trying to push through um, in the farm bill, and so we are um, really trying to um, uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. And I have some handouts to give people um, that you can you can sign a, a, a postcard to our members of Congress, encouraging them to push back against what is called the EATS Act, which is an acronym for the Ending Agricultural Trade Suppression Act. That's what oh. they call it. Basically, it's like, they're like, you know, don't get in our way. We want to be able to go and spray whatever we want in any community. And that's just not, that's not the way things are done in Maine. We, you know, across the board, we, we like to have our home role. Um, and then there's also another bill that's trying to be pushed through with a farm bill called the Agricultural Labeling Uniformity Act. And that would prevent states from requiring warning labels that are different from federal labels. So again, they're just trying to, like if, if Maine said, well, we want people to understand how serious chlorpyrifos is, even if, even if EPA still allows it to be used for certain instances, this 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 act would say no, nope, can't do that. So anyway, we're working on those two um, <clears throat> two um, bills at the federal level. We also um, are continuing to work with communities to try and help them um, promote safer land management um, in their in their um, community property as well as um, for homeowners. Two that are going on right now are the um, the towns of Hollowell and Cape Elizabeth. We're very hopeful that those towns will pass organic land care ordinances and join at least 31 other towns in Maine that have varying forms of, um, of pesticide ordinances. <clears throat> I just want to mention um, that we also have a really fascinating, another re 
another great and informative and fun resource on MAFCA's website that one of our longtime members of our public policy committee, Sharon Tischer, has worked on for many years, updates it regularly. It's very recently updated, but it's our pesticides quiz. So I encourage everybody to go to mafka.org, go to the policy section of our website and take the pesticides quiz. And it'll you'd be like even if you think you know a lot about pesticides, you might be surprised at what you can learn just by taking that quiz. And I'd be, I'd love to know how you do on it. Um, and um, I also want to um, to mention that um, the precautionary principle is really what we need to be striving for, which is basically assuring that or determining that there really is a problem to address and not using, not releasing chemicals into the environment or using chemicals to treat a problem unless you can absolutely assure that they are not going to have unintended consequences. That's the risk assessment approach. We want a more precautionary approach. And I do feel like in Maine, given the challenges we've had with the contamination of land all over the state, land and water from per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS, I think that our elected officials are trying, are finally starting to understand the importance of a precautionary approach. Rather than just saying, oh, we'll just try this and it'll probably be okay. Well, we tried that decades ago and now we recognize that PFAS, which is a very, very toxic class of chemicals, it's in all of our bodies, it's in the water we drink, it's in the soil, it's, it's all over the, the globe. And we should not have allowed that to, to happen. And it, it just underscores the importance of a precautionary approach. So I do feel like finally we are elevating that concept and understanding that we need to take a much safer um, approach to managing um, what we consider problems in our landscape. Um, and we know that there are organic, um, mechanical, and biological solutions to the challenges that we're facing every day. I, we feel that organic is not a niche. It is the future. It's the logical future. It's the way we have to go. And we have to continue to work with our elected officials to encourage them to um, implement really strict policies and and incentives to for others to embrace organic land here. Um, so I have some other um, postcards that I'm going to hand around to folks, and um, we also wanted to do um, open it up for questions to, to hear what questions you have, and um, we'll try to answer them. <coughs> yes. I don't know. I don't know if it's a question or a statement, but I thought what Chip was talking about with the paradigm change is really the root of what we all need to be working on, and this is a great place to be working on it. Um, a lot of minds get open at this event. Uh, I feel like we are. I always say that our habitats <coughs> are made by our habits, and and we've been in the paradigm where we're afraid of what we touch, we're afraid to engage, we're afraid to be active. And the alternative with an ecologically balanced organic approach is you want to be engaged. You want to be in your garden. You don't want to not worry. You want to lick your fingers. You want to taste the dirt on your on your food. And you want to get your kids out there and they're with you. Um, similarly, in our policy goals, we want people to be engaged. You can be afraid and not engaged, and the world will go to hell. Or you can be hopeful and get engaged, and you can make a huge difference. So your little patch of ground, and how you spend your time, and where you put your money, and where you vote, those make a huge difference. We are the answer to our problem. It's not going to come out of the box. It's not going to come from a fat talking guy from out of town who's an expert. So get engaged and encourage others to. A lot of this is about building confidence and community in the face of a real challenge. So thank you to all the people that are studying this. But until we spread it around, even if you're not sure, spread it around, ask questions. Um, so in that note, ask for questions. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. So I am very plant and 
right now, we have, I think, a bird. Yeah, we can find a bird or something. I think they're green. They have had white ones. Maybe they're white. But anyway, are they going to get red? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Winter berry plants. Um, she asked about winter berry plants. That some have green and some maybe maybe have white berries on them. And she asked, would they get red? And I said yes. Although it has been a really really weird year, and we have to acknowledge that there's been more rain than ever, um, and a lot of things. The trees and shrubs have done really well. The vegetable gardens and the, and the herbaceous perennials maybe not so much. It's just been like too much, too much rain, and it will probably be a little late. Okay. Other questions? I want to talk about your Unless there's somebody here from Cape Elizabeth, and then I would love to talk with them afterwards. But, you know. That's kind of misleading to say there's somebody here. If there's somebody here from any place <laughs> in Maine that doesn't have a pesticide ordinance, come and see us after, <laughs> and we'll get you started. Um, it's very challenging work, but it's very rewarding. I, I just wanted to say that Heather mentioned um, about the, uh, you know, uh, organics being sort of new. I think we need to change that. Because everything was organic before World War II, basically. It didn't, it, you know, it was a whole different thing. She talked about the 50s. And the 50s were, that was what was happening. A lot of it, they wanted to use it for ammunition, stuff that wasn't used for ammunition after the war to, to poison us, basically. Uh, and I, I think that's a really important uh, thing. This is, it's, organic isn't new. It's, Oh, yeah, I mean, it is a neonicotinoid that's came up. And so this is an interesting thing that you can take away on how the regulatory process works. And we think of environmental protection and human health protection. I've been to the EPA on the fourth floor and had the pesticide regulators talk to me about glyphosate is no big deal and gone to the first floor for the Office of Children's Health. And they said there should never be a pesticide in any school in the United States. Same building, two divisions. But neonicotinoids are an interesting story because, you know, the World War II, these chemicals came out, synthetic fertilizer, ammonium nitrate was a bomb. Organophosphate pesticides were nerve gases going back to World War I, World War II. And then they came on the market and they were marketed to us. So in the mid-1990s, science found a safer pesticide, right? They get away from those nerve agents and they came up with neonicotinoid pesticides as an insecticide for a variety of things. It's systemic. It gets in there. It affects pollinators. You heard about how it's put, and you know the tag in those, in, in those uh, plants? You know where they put the tag that says this was treated with neonicotinoid? In the bottom of the pot. It goes in the pot, empty pot, the tag goes on the bottom, all the soil goes in, and then they play. So you don't know until you knock it out. Neonicotinoids were developed because they're extremely low mammalian toxicity. Right? So there's something called an LD50 on how acutely toxic it is. And it had a really high number, which meant it wasn't highly toxic to mammals. So that's what the testing was done on. It came to the market in 1995 with no environmental testing. The manufacturer presented it for a conditional registration based on human health testing alone. And it took 20 years out in the field, in the real world, to find out how much damage it's done to pollinators, not just bees that are used strictly by moving around pollination, but all the native pollinators, how devastating it is. It's not the sole reason for colony collapse disorder, but it's one of three different things that are happening. But the bottom line is, it was never tested for environmental effects. So there's the risk versus benefit. No risk to the human population, So although well, there is, I don't say none, but minimal risk to the human population, devastating risk environmentally. So it was approved that way. 
And that is the same thing that's happening with those things that are more toxic to the human population. Because the research is done in-house, what the manufacturer chooses to submit may not be the full body of work. And, and there's been insecticides, there's been herbicides that were out in the field, highly dangerous, put on grass, and then all of a sudden all the trees started to die around it because nobody ever tested for it. So the basic message is, and what we have to educate others, you know, people that don't understand, is educate that the testing process that we all supposedly put our faith in is so flawed that what comes down to us when you go into a big box store and you smell that smell, a smell is an exposure. And they have pallets in the middle and kids walk up and lean on the pallet. And what's in there, you know, again, maybe 2% has been tested. So that's the message when we educate others that we need to and advocate for, you know, organic land management in all aspects of horticulture that we're operating under a flawed system. Evil system. <laughs> and Chip, we've, we've heard a lot about, um, you know, the concern that turf managers have about grubs and the, the, you know, the idea that they absolutely have to have exemptions for emergency treatment of drugs often with neonics. And, but you have shown that you can have, you know, a small homestead or a, even a giant, like, baseball stadium and manage it without the use of neonics. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the interesting thing is when you are subscribing to the chemical approach, synthetic chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides, you're just wiping out soil biological life. So a conventional golf course guy, or somebody that's trained in conventional horticulture, they don't even know what a bacteria, fungi, or protozoa is. They don't understand the underground portion of the nitrogen cycle. And they're using products that are constantly diminishing that. When you diminish that, now you're reliant on all of your synthetics. But if you promote biological life, if you move beyond fertilizers and do soil amendments, things like kelp and humic acid, build soil structure, build the quality of the soil, get an active and aggressive functional beneficial biomass, those guys are going to eat the little eggs from the beetle before they ever get to develop into the root feeding stage called the grub. And just a natural aggressive system will keep things and the key is below a threshold level. Even in conventional integrated pest management, which allows for pesticide use in the end, organic integrated pest management that I've developed does not allow for synthetic, but there's a threshold level. So if you have 10 grubs in a square foot, you're going to get damage. If you have two or three, no damage, leave them alone. They'll wiggle around and they'll loosen the soil yes, for you. Skunk. But yeah, it's not gonna have any. But the bottom line is these conventional turf bandages, if they see one or two grubs, they say, Oh, it's gonna ruin my whole field, but now they take one point three acres and drench it in the ocean. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I repeat my offer if anyone is interested in further policy work at the local level or the state level, come see us at